Professor Sylvia Angelique Alajaji. We are very honored to have her here. She's going to speak to us on music and the Armenian diaspora, searching for home in exile, which is based on the talk is based on her book. Uh, she is associate professor and chair of music uh, at Franklin and Marshall College, where she also teaches in the international studies program. Uh, she is the author of uh, Music and the Armenian Diaspora, uh, which recently was published in Turkish translation. Uh, congratulations. Uh, she received her PhD from the uh, University of Rochester's Eastman School of Music. In the fall of 2020, she will serve as the Dumanian Visiting Professor of Armenian Studies at the University of Chicago. Please give uh, Professor Alajaji a very warm welcome. Thank you so much, Huri, for um, the invitation, the wonderful introduction, and just being a, a, an amazing uh, host. I'm so honored to, to be here, and especially I've been so grateful to have such a warm uh, uh, introduction to, to so many of you. And I don't think she's here, but Cynthia B., is that who she, she really helped quite a bit. So in absentia, please relate to her my, my, uh, my gratitude. So I am going to be giving a, sort of a more uh, typical formal uh, talk in a, a few minutes. But before I get to that part of it, I wanted to just talk a little bit about my book in, in very general terms and really about uh, what's, what led me to asking the questions that I ask um, in my book. So I'm going to throw something out there, though, before I start uh, my talk. And I don't know how many people in the room are Armenians or how many non-Armenians there are in the room, but regardless of what your background is, I want you to just do a little experiment with me. If I say Armenian music, I want you to note what you're thinking, right? If I say Armenian music, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? Okay, and so just sit with that, and then I want to come back to, come back to that um, a little bit later on. So my book essentially revolves around that question, what is Armenian music? And in the book itself, I explore this question, what is Armenian music, through an examination of five different snapshots. So these snapshots vary in time and location. So the first one looks at Gomidas, who's an Armenian uh, composer and musicologist, and it looks right at the period, right before the genocide in the, in the Ottoman Empire. And then from there, the next snapshot goes to New York City in the 30s and 40s. And then from there, we go to Beirut for two different uh, musical moments. And then we come back to California. So in, do, in approaching the book this way, these different snapshots, there's no, I'm not sort of imposing a narrative. Uh, what I rather do in, in the book is hold these different snapshots in simultaneity and, and, and getting us to a place where we look at Armenian identity as a contrapuntal thing, where there's not one sort of essential, essentialized narrative that we can say about Armenian music. But depending on where you are at what time, right, the answer to that question, what is Armenian music, looks very different depending on who you're talking to and, um, and when. That's what the book ended up being, but that's not what I went into it expecting to do. Um, I initially, back you know, when I was sort of thinking about what it is that I cared the most about and what I wanted to study, really my idea was quite vague. I wanted to study Armenian music and identity, but particularly how a sense of Armenianness was retained through music, despite centuries, you know, of dispersion after the genocide and all of that. Those things that we, as Armenians, um, know so well. So, why was I interested in this question? As Laila Abu Lugod has written, "Standing on shifting ground makes it clear that every view is a view from somewhere, and every act of speaking is speaking from somewhere." So me asking this question had a lot to do with the somewhere that I myself was, um, was occupying. I'm Armenian, but my Armenianness is not something that is immediately read onto me. I don't necessarily look, you know, Armenian, whatever that, whatever that means. 
Um, both my parents are Armenian, but I don't have the IAN last name, right? And so usually I have to prove my Armenianness in some way. And the way that I often do that is by saying, no, no, both my parents on both sides, uh, my relatives were killed in the genocide. And so the genocide became sort of my, you know, my no, I promise you I'm Armenian sort of um, sort of link. Um, and then on top of all of that, I grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which, as you all know, is the hub of Armenian activity <laughs> in, in the United States. So not only did I sort of not have like the typical markers of um, or the outward facing uh, markers of Armenianness, but I was in Tulsa, Oklahoma, of all places. And um, I still haven't quite forgiven my parents for <laughs> for that. But, you know, I've, I've, I've made my my peace with it. So, and there was a tiny Armenian community there that became, and are, they're still my, my, my family. But, so for me, when I talk about Armenian identity, it's inseparable from this space that I occupied, right? Where I grew up virtually absent of a community. And so when I think about Armenianness, I think about that space in my house where I grew up. Being Armenian for me was that fluidity. My parents would speak, you know, Turkish, Arabic, Armenian, depending on, you know, what the subject was. So if, you know, they were trying to, if we were cursing, it was in Arabic. I don't know why. <laughs> um, Turkish was when my parents wanted to say something and they didn't want the kids to understand. Um, Armenian was for everything else. And as we got older, you know, that became, that became uh, less and less. Um, there was the food, of course, but then for me in particular to to my upbringing, there was music and there was there's there were, I'll never forget. There was this cassette tape that my dad had um, this, you know, cassette tape of, of his favorite songs. Uh, both my parents are from Beirut and um, they immigrated to the United States. And my dad had this cassette tape of all his favorite songs from uh, from when he was growing up. And on there was ABBA, of course, as all good Armenian boys have, Adis Harmandian, of course, some Peruz. And then also there was Hava Nagila on there, which I still don't, I still don't understand. But that to me was being Armenian, right? It was like this totally fluid, chaotic space. And, and that, that was all it was to me. And this was the space where my Armenianness existed. And when I think back, some of my happiest memories were in those moments of music. At home, when I was growing up, it was at the height of the civil war in Beirut. And so it was a very tense time, right? Those of us in the room who, who have similar backgrounds know that, you know, moments of whenever the phone would ring, like in moments of silence, your heart would sort of, you know, just fall, just not knowing what was going to be on the other end of that phone call. So there was a lot of sadness. There was a lot of tension. But when I think about when we were the happiest, music was always a part of that. There would be laughter and there would be dancing. My dad's cassette would come on. There would be music and we would just forget. My cousins would visit. There would be music. Our little tiny Armenian community would get together and there would be music. So for me, I know I keep saying this, but music was inseparable from what it was to be Armenian. And so later on, you know, I grew up and I decided to become an ethnomusicologist as and my parents were just absolutely, absolutely thrilled <laughs> to, <laughs> to, to hear about this. And as you know, I embarked on this 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 path that my life would go on this this my love of Armenian music stayed with me. And I thought, you know what, I'm going to study this. I want to I want to, you know, make this make this my part of my uh, my academic life. And so, of course, I did what every you know, academic does. I went to the books and there was very, very, very little research like in English, you know, for like ethnomusicology students. Um, there was very little written on Armenian music. But what I did find in those early days of my, the beginnings of my research sort of stopped me in my tracks because what I was reading about was so different than everything that I held dear, right? It was so, the memories that I had cherished, the, dan the songs that we would dance to, those things that had made, that sort of represented to me my Armenianness. none of that was being written about. And so, when, so that really made me start thinking, right, about, 
okay, how are we defining what Armenian music is, right? The, the answer that I would have given you from my youth looked very different from what I was seeing in these books. And so as I started digging and as I started talking to people, I realized that I was really stepping into quite a minefield uh, when I would ask people you know, about Armenian music. And uh, one thing that I saw immediately was that there, and this is not necessarily unique to, to, um, to the Armenian, uh, to Armenian music necessarily, but one thing that I found, especially doing, you know, mostly English language scholarship, is that there's a definition of Armenian music, like if you were to put on a concert of Armenian music, you know, that you expected Odars to come to, right? Like the outside, outside community to come to. There's a certain expectation of what kind of Armenian music should be displayed to the outside world. But then when you're at home in private, in the familial sphere, right? If your cousins come over, the music you're going to listen to is going to be very different than that outward facing music, right? And so I really wanted to examine that tension right with that insider sort of outsider um, uh, music that we have the other thing that I saw also however is that this discourse of what is Armenian music was one that was being hotly debated among Armenians themselves right if we are going to have this outward facing Armenian music who gets to decide what that is who gets to decide what counts as Armenian music and what doesn't count as Armenian music, right? And obviously, as I'm sure you're already jumping here before me, but essentially what we all realize is that we're not really talking about Armenian music, right? Armenian music is becoming a shorthand for what it means to be Armenian. And so that's really the meditation that my book is, is looking at through these different snapshots, why Armenian music means what it does at certain points in time, and then what happens when those different definitions clash, right? Because ultimately, this sort of simultaneity, when you're dealing with a group of people who are fighting for recognition, fighting for survival, that multiplicity can be something that's threatening. And so, um, so yeah, so that's what I'm, I'm uh, looking at. And uh, what I'm going to do today is talk mainly about uh, this composer and musicologist Gomidas, um, who when you think about, when I did that experiment just now, I'm, I'll be curious to know how many of you thought Gomidas, because Gomidas is, is really sort of the, the Armenian music, like he's who, who most people think about when they think about um, Armenian music. But before I get to sort of the more formal part of my talk, I did want to give you a bit of a sense of like that minefield that I'm talking about when we, when we talk about what is Armenian music. And so this is something that um, you can look at like newspapers starting, you know, in the 60s, the 70s. You'll see letters to the editor. You'll see uh, you'll see articles where people where the community in, in, uh, is basically duking out what is Armenian music going to be. And um, so I was very taken with when I first started um, really exploring this. I happened to come upon a passage from Peter Najayan's uh, book, Daughters of Memory. And there's this really, really uh, striking moment. Uh, there are three older women who are all survivors of the genocide and they're speaking with one another. And, um, and I was just reading this unrelated to my research and then I saw this part and um, it really struck me. Um, I'll just read it out loud. It's still our language. People make too much of language. To tell you the truth, I enjoy speaking Turkish more. It's my first language. Some of us hate it. The Dashnaks even want to change the words in the songs. They can't change the words. All the pleasure is in the words. No, they say the words are filth. Listen, I know what filth is. I know you know. They lay on top of me and they left me for dead. Every one of them lay on top of me, and I was only 14, and I will never stop hating them. But when I hear their songs, I love their strings and their words. You can say that, I can say it, because she loves music. It isn't only their music, it's our music too. And that does, those two last lines 
I found so gripping, right? She loves music. It's not their music. It's our music, too. So what you see in this discourse, in these debates, right, it's their music, our music, what's theirs, what's ours. And in a lot of these letters to the editor that or these letters that I found, this was in Los in the L.A. Times in 1976. I would like to point out, oh, there was a Turkish dance ensemble, Fotem, that was performing in LA, and there was a huge, huge protest, and they were performing on April 24th. And um, they were supposed to perform for two nights. The first night, it was canceled because of the protest. The second night, there was an explosion. Um, and so it was also canceled after that. Um, and so, of course, it was being covered quite a bit in the LA Times. And this was a letter that was written by an Armenian. And what I found so interesting, and this letter is very different than a lot of the commentary that you see later on. In this letter, he's saying, the, the writer is saying that the dances that this ensemble are doing are actually Armenian, right? So he's saying that these Turkish dances are Armenian dances. And what you see later on is a distancing from, from these dances, right? Where they say, no, actually, that's Turkish. We have nothing to do with that. And so the, the tone of these letters really starts to change um, over time. And then here in the foreword from Gary and Susan, uh, th this amazing uh, book, Gary and Susan Lin San Sinanyan, the ancient Anatolian dances are being lost by the Anatolian Armenian survivors in America and elsewhere. Because these Anatolian dances are now also done by Turks, many Armenians have repudiated them along with anything else suspected of having Turkish influence. So again, what is authentic Armenian? What is pure Armenian? Another one in 1987, an ongoing debate. What is the authentic music and dancing? Um, our dance and music and our and this was from a this was a letter from somebody who's disappointed in the sort of like um, arguments for purity. Our dance and music in our attempts not to be of Turkish flavor has degenerated to a point that I can no longer understand or enjoy. After the Turks took our lives, our land, our whole body and soul, after all this, we give them our folk culture and consider it to be theirs, not ours. And then even as recently as 2011 in the Armenian Weekly, this was in response to um, a review of an album that was put out of um, the music of Ottoman Armenians. And a lot of these songs are in Turkish. And so somebody, so the comments just exploded in this debate yet again about, you know, do we count this music as Armenian? And this person said, all I want is an occasional Anatolian kef without censorship. Don't rob me of my birthright, fellow Armenians. Don't rob me of what I grew up with. Don't rob me of what my grandparents and parents shared with me in my growing up years. Don't rob me of my soul. So this just gives you a very brief sense of the debate that has taken place even within Armenia and among Armenians about, you know, how to define what Armenian music is. One thing that I do not want to do is to give the impression that this is as simple as saying, you know, is this about being Turkish or being Armenian? What we're talking about is a lot more complex. So when I said to you, you know, what is Armenian music? What does that even mean, right? Are we talking about the country of Armenia? Are we talking about people who are Armenian? Are we talking about things that are in the Armenian language? What exactly is it that we're looking for when we say something is or is not Armenian? And so that's sort of the interrogation that I'm, um, that I'm the most interested in um, in my own work. Okay, so all that being said, um, I'm going to talk now about Gomidas and the place that he has come to occupy in, um, in Armenian identity and especially in his place as sort of like the central figure of, um, of Armenian music. Perhaps it was my mistake. After all, I would contact potential interviewees and ask if I could speak with them with what in hindsight was a very vague explanation of my work. I'm doing a project on the relationship between music and diasporic Armenian identity. Looking back, it's no surprise that the game of telephone that would often transpire, my research was summed up with the far pithier, she's doing a project on Armenian music. Not music and Armenian identity, but Armenian music. This was a minefield if there ever was one. For in that crucial switching of the modifier from diaspora or from identity to music, my project, vague as it was to begin with, took on the added dimension of a shorthand that I had not prepared myself to contend with, Armenian music. 
in I would come to my interviews, all smiles and nerves, and there they would sit, patient, perhaps a bit uncertain, and I'd begin, first, of course, by clarifying that, yes, I am also Armenian. Um, so I would ask, can you tell me about X? Some genre of, of Armenian, of, of music that I was considering Armenian. And the person would respond, and if any of you are Armenian, then you'll, you'll be able to understand this exchange very well. So I would say, can you tell me about X? The person would say, well, why do you want to know about that? <laughs> and I said, well, well, you know, my project. And they would cut me off and say, yeah, yes, your project on Armenian music. And I'd say, yes, yes, my project on Armenian music. And then I'd be greeted with, that's not Armenian music. And immediately I would sort of panic and think, what in the world am I going to do now? So, and admittedly, all I had in those moments was evidence that no scholar should rely on. My father's dusty records, <laughs> memories of dancing with my cousins to Karun Karun, my mother's and aunt's stories of growing up with my orphan Dede, who, with his mischievous, mischievous twinkling eye, tortured them with double zurna, double zurna, always double zurna. The Davul Zurna, if you don't know, is um, a, you know Turkish Armenian uh, wind instrument. These memories that, to me, were some of the remaining tenuous gasps of an Armenianness that, once again, were not enough. More than once, I was told that while it would be okay for an Odar to write about the music that I was asking about, as an Armenian, I had a responsibility. Why would I write about, depending on what I had asked, this unserious picnic music, this music of our oppressors, this music that, quote, accelerates our dissolution as a people? As was implied many times throughout my fieldwork, there was a separation between those musical genres that were considered to be unquestionably Armenian and those genres that were widely acknowledged to be significant to the Armenian community but were not considered to be Armenian. It became routine for me to explain during my interviews that, yes, I'm aware that this music is not Armenian, but would you mind telling me what it means to you? But sometimes I relented, curious to see where the conversation would go, to see what, in fact, was Armenian music. I was eager to understand this thing that was being presented as a known, an ostensibly fixed unit of analysis, immutable, certain, and somewhat, somehow incommensurable with the private realms of memory, family, and history. I wanted to understand what Armenian music was shorthand for, the discourses of nation, self, and Armenianness that it embedded, the belonging it delineated and enabled. There was talk of the Badarak, which is the Armenian mass, often of medieval Khaz notation, sacred music, choral songs, lullabies, and various village folk songs from the Armenian highlands. And then there was one name over and over again, Gomidas, always Gomidas. Gomidas, our savior, Gomidas, whose frame picture often loomed above us, kindly, serene, perhaps ever so slightly mischievous, unaware of his eventual undoing, we look at him today, knowing what he does not know, knowing how it was all to end for him and for us. In these conversations, it was clear, Gomidas is Armenian music. Armenian music is Gomidas. Gomidas was born Soroman Soromanyan in Kutaya, a city in the Ottoman Empire in 1869. As the story normally goes, an Armenian priest discovered the orphan Gomidas while visiting Kutaya, and upon witnessing his impoverished condition and hearing his singing abilities, whisked him off to study at a seminary in the Holy See of Echmiadzin in Armenia, which was then part of the Russian Empire. There, he quickly learned Armenian and gained prominence as one of the school's most accomplished and talented students. In 1894, he was ordained a celibate priest and was given the name Gomidas after the 7th century poet and composer. Gomidas spent the next three years studying musicology in Berlin. Upon his return to Armenia, he collected folk songs throughout remote mountain and countryside villages. He refused to work in the cities, finding that music to be corrupt, and amassed close to several thousand songs. Gomidas's overall mission was to isolate a distinct national style which he sought among the folk songs of the peasantry of these isolated villages through historic Armenia. Gomidas actively promoted his findings, whether through publishing articles in various newspapers and journals, presenting lectures and concerts in academic circles throughout Europe, publishing collections of folk songs, or composing harmonized versions of the songs he had transcribed. 
He incorporated the idioms of the songs he identified as uniquely Armenian, as opposed to Turkish, Kurdish, or Arabic, into his own compositions, many of which were choral works performed by his choirs. This, in turn, assured the dissemination of the distinctive musical language he located in his transcriptions. Although he was never overtly political, in asserting the uniqueness of Armenian music, Gomidas was, by extent, asserting the uniqueness of the Armenian people as a whole. For example, in a review of a collection of Armenian folk songs published in 1900, Gomidas angrily stated, quote, Mr. Erzaryan, the editor, has been too hasty and consequently published foreign melodies as Armenian folk songs, as a result of which, of course, a mistaken and converse opinion will be formed about our moral and intellectual life, our past and our present. So you see Gomidas already saying, articulating something that is going to be repeated every, with every generation, right? When you say what is Armenian music, you're saying something about the people um, themselves. The work Gomidas was doing clearly played well into the overriding sentiments of the late 19th to early 20th century. His presentation of folk music as a distinct and unique facet of Armenian culture corresponded to the atmosphere being created by the revolutionaries during this time and contributed to the need for a collective identity necessary for claims to nationhood. For Gomidas, the Armenian peasantry was inextricably associated with nature, and the mountains, lakes, and valleys immortalized in their songs were of great symbolic and historic significance to the Armenians, particularly in this time of emerging national consciousness. By promoting these songs as Gomidas did, harmonizing them into choral arrangements, and performing them throughout the diaspora, the Armenia of the peasantry became a shared experience for those Armenians separated either by class or geographical boundary, and then which thus fit with the unifying aims of the revolutionary parties. As Mark Nishanyan has noted, Gomidas's work elevated the music of the peasantry to art, art with a capital A, an aestheticization that in, in Nishanyan's words, quote, creates the nation. He writes, quote, art is that which has the power of revelation and manifestation. These popular sources include not only the, tra the people's tragic songs, but also its narratives, tales, and myths, which resemble an undreamed dream, end quote. For this aestheticization, Gomidas was venerated by intellectual revolutionaries, poets, and writers, including Barujan, Oshagan, and Charens. In their work, it is clear that the ethnographic pursuit of authenticity, hidden, buried in the countryside, and discovered and elevated to an art by Gomidas, was fundamental to the manifestation of nation. In 1914, Konstant Zarian wrote in an essay titled The Heart of the Fatherland, when, from an extensive fatherland's every corner, from its mountain peaks, from the depths of its fields, from, its, from atop its boulders, the voices and songs of those who live by creating rise up, when they feel an imperative need to express, as destiny commands, their soul's secret and eyes light, the heart of the fatherland shall amazingly vibrate with miraculous life. And then, oh, I know this past all doubting, then the choral song of the new Ashug shall rise joyous and clear, declaiming the new mythology. For the style will have been discovered. Style is the race's image, its coat of arms, its crown, studied with gems, ch charged with meaning. So again, music is being elevated to this level, right? Music is the race's image, its coat of arms, its crown, studded with gems, charged with meaning. And in the same journal, a few pages later, Oshagan writes, quote, a priest of labor, Gomidas, has transformed our songs into music as a revelation for us, for whom they had become something foreign. Transform our songs into music. Songs into music. I'll return to this a bit later on. On April 24, 1915, Gomidas was arrested. Although he was among the fortunate few to survive, he suffered a debilitating mental breakdown that forced him to spend the rest of his life in a mental hospital in Paris. He died in the asylum in 1935. The following year, his ashes were transferred to Armenia. So rather than asking who was Gomidas, perhaps it makes more sense to ask who is Gomidas to Armenians today, for he is as present as ever. Gomidas, in many ways, is Armenia or rather he embodies the possibility of Armenia. 
With Gomidas, there is no qualifier of Eastern or Western. As Nishanyan writes, he is, quote, doubtless the only personage of any importance claimed by both Eastern and Western Armenians as one of their own, end quote. He has become an emblem of the homeland, not the one bounded by the confines of the nation state, but the symbolic, spiritual, imagined homeland, the one that dares to ask, what if? In his haunting poem, Requiem Eternem, in memory of Gomidas, written in 1936, shortly after Gomidas's death, Yerishe Sharens characterizes Gomidas as, quote, the song of the homeland. This sonically re-territorialized Armenia, read onto Gomidas's work, operates in many ways as a centralizing force against the pluralities and multidimensionalities of the Armenian diasporic reality. In Gomidas is the possibility of Armenia in the singular. I think, for example, of the centennial slogan, I remember, I demand. In this, there is only I, an unequivocally singular voice that belies those many contrapuntal layers of the diaspora. And from where is this I, the singularity, to come? How can we sound the transnation to Baruch HaTik Tololian's terminology? To many, this I, the singular, is sounded and made possible in the work of Gomidas. Too often the analysis stops here. <coughs> For what is to be gained from puncturing the Gomidas mythos? He is embedded in the Armenian consciousness like no other. Monuments have been erected in his honor all over the world. From the Armenian cities of Yerevan, Echmiadzin, and Bagar Shapat to Paris, Detroit, and Quebec City. In Armenia, where there are no less than five landmarks and countless streets named after him, his name graces not only the country state music conservatory, but the pantheon where leading artistic figures from Armenia and the diaspora are buried. In London, there is the Gomidas Institute, an academic research institution and publishing house. And in 1965, the Soviet Union released a stamp in his honor. UNESCO included his 150th birthday, which was just last year in 2019 on its official calendar of anniversaries. In the course of my work, I was excitedly shown cherished items collected over the years, yellowed recital programs featuring his arrangements, worn editions of his badarak, and pictures taken at monuments erected in his honor. I was played classical pieces featuring his transcribed folk melodies, recordings of his singing, and pop and techno covers of his compositions. For the Armenians in the room, I heard so many techno covers of Gurung that I, <laughs> that you should you should pity me. <laughs> I was generously given books and articles by and about him in a variety of languages. To many of the people I spoke with, Gomidas and his work allowed for a sense of self, but perhaps more importantly, a sense of unity. In light of the continuing traumas of the genocide, the continued sense of a loss of home and the disconnection felt in the diaspora between communities and from Armenia, Gomidas seemed to be an increasingly rare shared symbol that not only connects the diasporic communities to each other, but given his significance in Armenia, connects the diaspora to Armenia. And at this point in my research, there was little in the scholarly literature that dared to suggest otherwise. But then one day, as it happens, something happened that threw all of this into disarray. Someone made a simple comment that had the potential of upending what I had come to understand this whole time. I was speaking to someone and for the first time, I found that I had to bring up Gomidas myself. They looked at me, sighed, and looked away. Almost under their breath, they said, Gomidas is important. Yes, he was a genius, but he made our music European. And suddenly, just like that, I began to listen to what was there as much as what was not there. Yes, in the Gomidas that is venerated, mythologized today, is the possibility of Armenia. But what would happen if we were to poke at the borders of the sonic world and to interrogate the sonic alignments that they facilitate? To do so would be to interrogate the very home that has made wholeness possible to see it for its possibilities and impossibilities, its inclusions and exclusions. For although through Gomidas, the diaspora may be able to see itself as an us, after all, there can be no us without a them. In this sonically boundaried home, who belongs? Who does not? In making Gomidas synonymous with Armenia, which of the worlds in this transnation, for are there so many, for there are so many, had been made impossible? When stitching together us, to paraphrase David Kazanjian, I wonder, quote, 
who has been excluded from this repaired whole. Nishanyan refers to Gomidas' work as a Hegelian sublation, something that is simultaneously changed, negated, yet preserved. In the process of creating music out of song, creating art, there is indeed something both preserved yet changed. Could we perhaps also see that in the becoming of a transnation, in the imposition of a singular onto that which is plural, one out of the many, something is indeed preserved, yet what happens when the cacophony of the multiplicity of the transnation is sublimated into one? What is the sound of that singular? Embedded in that answer is a beginning, a point of departure. As Edward Said writes, beginnings, unlike origins, are chosen. They are, quote, points of departure, end quote, that allow one to proceed along a given course. Points of departure, in other words, that simultaneously enable, determine, embed, and frame the subsequent becoming. This transitive beginning, as Said calls it, quote, foresees a continuity that flows from it. This kind of beginning allows us to initiate, to direct, to measure time to construct work, to discover, to produce knowledge, end quote. Gomidas's music then enabled a becoming born of this sublation. So again, I return, what is the sound of that singular? What is the sound of the I in I remember? There is perhaps no song more frequently rendered in any Armenian musical gathering than Gomidas's own Gurung, fitting as it's about a singer pleading for news from the homeland. So uh, the lyrics here, Gurung ustigu kas tsarayam tsaynit, Gurung mer ashkaren khabrik mechunis, inch badaskan chidbir yelar kenatsir, Gurung mer ashkaren dikena hratsir. Crane, from where do you come? I thirst for your voice. Crane, do you not have any news from our homeland? You did not answer me, you flew away. Crane, go, fly away from our homeland. This song is, any Armenian in the room knows this song. I can, I can pretty much guarantee it. Um, the very first commercially recorded composition by Gomidas in 1901 was actually Gurung. In the setting now made iconic by Isabel Bayraktarian, I, I now pose the question to you, what is the home she is yearning for? Her soaring operatic soprano, Grammy winning, heard at opera houses across the United States and Europe. I'm going to play a little bit of this. This has perhaps become one of the most uh, iconic renderings of Gurung. So that was Isabel Bayrak Darian and singing the, the version of, Gomit, of, of the version of Gurung that is, is the, most, uh, the most common or the most popular. So now I'm going to play a version of Gurung by George Magardichian. This was from, it's unclear when this was recorded, sometimes, sometime between the 40s and the, and the 60s. Now, I want you to imagine the home that this Gurung is, is, um, is encapsulating. In this version, he's on, there's no singing. It's only George Magardichian playing it on the oud. Mm -hmm. And as we think about that, think also about the symbolic nature of the oud, what it means to play gurung on an, in, on an instrument that most people wouldn't see as an authentic Armenian instrument. <laughs> Thank you. 
is this the Gurung of the Armenian Transnation? What is the beginning that this version enables? And now I'll, the last one I'll play is one sung by Zabel Panosyan, who emigrated to the US from Bardazig in the Ottoman Empire in 1896. Listen as she sings Gurung. But note as you're listening that this isn't Gomidas's Gurung. It's someone else's setting. No, nobody seems to know whose it is. All that is known is that it's a rendition specific to her village in the Ottoman Empire and that it was recorded in 1917. And I wonder, is this the Gurung of the Armenian Transnation? <laughs> So three very different settings, three very different settings that each symbolically connotes an Armenianness that might be incommensurable with another. And so I'll end just by revisiting that question that I started with, what is Armenian music? And I can say that after all of this research that I've been doing, I don't think it's a question that we necessarily need to answer, but I do think it's a question that we need to ask. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you.